my joy to be with you here this evening and to make a presentation about Sinai and about the library in order to show the continuing significance of the manuscripts I am going to speak about five in particular and then I would be happy to answer questions at the end the history of a Christian and monastic presence at Sinai begins not in Byzantine times but extends back into the years of classical antiquity. One of the earliest narratives to come down to us from that time is Ammonius' account of the 40 martyrs of Sinai and Raitho. There we read about monks who had been living in the Sinai deserts for 40 years and for 50 and for 60 and for 70 years who have dwelt in the same place. We also read about a monk named Moses who was admired by all for his zeal and for his grave manner of life. A certain Moses, having adopted the discipline of monasticism from his youth, practiced monasticism for 73 years in that mountain from which springs of water issued. And this saint, from the time that he took the habit of Christ, ate no flesh, but he ate dates only. The food of that saint was a few dates and water only, and he never tasted wine, and his dress was of compressed palm fiber, and he loved silence more than all men. From the many miracles that God wrought through him, all the inhabitants of Haran had come to believe in the Holy Trinity and received holy baptism. I was in Raithau in July a few years ago, the temperature registered 118 degrees Fahrenheit. A hot and searing breeze blew from across the Red Sea. It was yet another small insight into the heroism of the monks who lived there in centuries gone by. The historical events described by Ammonius allow us to date his account to the year 373. Thus, when he describes elders who have dwelt there as monks for 60, for 70, and more years, we understand that there was already an established monasticism at Sinai and Raitho at the end of the third and the very beginning of the fourth century, when persecutions were still raging against the Christians. Even then, there dwelt ascetics in the Sinai deserts who were established in virtue who had attained to the pinnacles of prayer and spiritual graces. Another important early text is a travel account of Egeria, who made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, after which she continued on to Sinai around the year 383. She worshiped at the chapel at the peak of Sinai and at the cave of the prophet Elias below the peak, after which she descended into the valley to the church of the burning bush. She writes, there are many cells of holy men and a church on the spot where the bush stands. And this bush is still alive today and gives forth shoots. The monks celebrated the liturgy for the pilgrims and read for them those passages of scripture concerning the events that had taken place at each site. They also presented them with fruits from their gardens. From the fourth century, Sinai was a place where monks lived in solitude and austerity, but it was also a place of pilgrimage, and these two strands have continued throughout the history of the area, even to our own day. In the sixth century, the Emperor Justinian ordered the construction of a basilica and high surrounding walls, which has stood ever since. This was done to honor this holy place and to protect the monks who lived there. The church is remarkably well preserved. Not only are the columns and capitals and walls intact, but the central doors into the nave and the heavy ceiling beams also date from the sixth century. And the focal point of the church is the mosaic of the transfiguration, one of the most profound works of art from that time. The lintel over the door into the nave bears this inscription. And the Lord spake unto Moses at this place, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am that I am. We can date the completion of the basilica to within a few years from the inscriptions carved on the beams. 
The seventh beam, counting from the west end, bears an inscription meant to be visible to those entering the nave for the memory and repose of our late Empress Theodora. The eighth beam bears the inscription for the salvation of our most pious Emperor Justinian. The inscription on the one beam commemorates the Empress Theodora as having passed away, while the inscription on the other commemorates the Emperor Justinian as still living. We know that the Empress Theodora died in the year 548, while the Emperor Justinian died in 565. These two dates provide the beginning and the ending dates for the completion of the Basilica. Is it possible to make these dates even more precise? Procopius, in his work on buildings, mentions that at the base of the mountain where Moses received the laws from God, the emperor built a very strong fortress with a church dedicated to the mother of God to enable the anchorites who dwelt there to pass their lives therein, praying and holding services. Many scholars feel that Procopius on buildings was completed in the year 554 to 555, though others have argued for the date 559 to 560. Even the latter would allow us to narrow the date for the completion of the basilica to within a span of 12 years. A Greek plaque on the west wall of the monastery refers to the completion of the monastery in the 30th year of the reign of the Emperor Justinian, which would be the year 557. Although this particular inscription is not early, it may have been based on earlier records. The date indicated is in keeping with the other dates that we have seen. There is one last inscription to be considered. The mosaic of the transfiguration of Christ includes this dedicatory inscription. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, this entire work was executed for the salvation of those who had offered the fruits by Longinus the most pious presbyter and abbot. The work of Theodore, Presbyter and Depterarius, in Diction 14. This same Abbot Longinus is, is portrayed in one of the medallions of the mosaic with a white square placed behind his head as an indication that he was still living at the time. In the years we have been considering, the 14th indiction would have fallen during the years 550 to 551 or 565 to 566. The latter date is the more probable for the completion of the mosaic. The entire subsequent history of St. Catherine's Monastery may be said to have been written between the ruling lines that we have now traced. The Persians sacked Jerusalem in 614, but it was not worth their while to cross the desert to this remote site. Its very isolation protected it. Islam came to the area in the year 632, but Muslims also revere Sinai as a sacred mountain, and the monks found a way to live in peace with their neighbors. The monastery continued as it had of old. Ascetics came to this desolate wilderness and reached great spiritual heights. Their writings have been treasured by Christians throughout the world ever since. The most important book to be written at Sinai is called The Ladder of Divine Ascent, in which the author took the ladder that Jacob saw extending from earth to heaven as a motif for the spiritual life. St. John of the Ladder was abbot of Sinai in the late 6th century. Before being elected abbot, he had lived as an anchorite for 40 years, during which he had spent his time saying prayers and copying books. This is an indirect witness to the production of manuscripts at Sinai. Precious manuscripts were also brought to the monastery over the years. The monastery has never been destroyed or abandoned in all of its centuries of existence. The climate at Sinai is surprisingly dry and stable, the humidity averaging between 20 and 30 percent. All of this and the diligent care of the monks account for the preservation of many manuscripts. The Sinai Library is today a remarkable treasure for the antiquity and the significance of its volumes. 
The library contains 3,304 manuscripts written in 11 languages. These are predominantly Greek, Arabic, Syriac, Georgian, and Slavonic. The manuscripts range in content from copies of the scriptures, services, and music manuscripts, to sermons, writings of the fathers, lives of the saints, and books of inherited spiritual wisdom. The library also includes medical treatises, historical chronicles, and texts in classical Greek, which is the pinnacle of the Greek language. A few of the manuscripts are splendid works of art with gilded letters and brilliant illuminations created in Constantinople in the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries when the city was at its height as a center of culture and devotion. But no less significant are the humble manuscripts written at Sinai, often on reused parchment, bound between rough boards, the pages stained from long use, a witness to the deprivations and austerity of Sinai to the generations of monks who have maintained the life of devotion and the cycle of daily services at this holy place. But perhaps we would come to a greater appreciation of the Sinai Library if I could describe five manuscripts in particular, all of which have been studied by scholars within the past year. Aramaic was a language spoken in Palestine at the time of Jesus, and there are a number of Aramaic words and phrases preserved as such in the Greek New Testament. Kekratisas tis hiros tu pavio legiapi talitha kumi oesti metermina vomenon tokorasion si lego egira. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. In St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, he quotes the Aramaic word maranatha, which means come, O Lord, or our Lord is come, a prayer that must have been familiar to them and which goes back to the first Aramaic-speaking Christians. A number of manuscripts survive in Christian Palestinian Aramaic, the earliest dating from the 6th century. They are written in a Syriac script, though Syriac and Aramaic are different languages. The texts are mostly copies of the scriptures, liturgical texts, and lives of the saints. Centuries ago, the Sinai manuscripts were kept in a number of different places within the monastery. Some of the oldest were stored in a room in the Tower of St. George, which projects off the north wall of the monastery. In 1734, Archbishop Nikiforos Marthalis created rooms opposite the Archbishop's quarters for the manuscripts and asked that they be gathered there from the various areas where they had been stored before. We know now that manuscripts that were already in a ruinous state, as well as loose leaves and fragments, were left behind in this tower room. Some time later, the roof above them collapsed. There they remained until 1975, when one monk was carrying out repairs to the tower and came across this deposit of manuscripts. They are collectively known as the New Finds. Among them were a number of manuscripts written in Christian Palestinian Aramaic. A manuscript that dates from the 7th or 8th centuries contains the sayings of the Desert Fathers, number 59, in the collection. One of the most beautiful is a lectionary dating from the 13th century, manuscript number 41. Professor Alain Desremoux from Paris is a recognized authority on texts written in Aramaic. He visited the monastery during the first week in June of this year and spent some time studying these manuscripts. He hopes to edit and publish them, thus adding to the number of known texts in Christian Palestinian Aramaic. The writings of Dionysius the Arabagite consist of four treatises and 10 letters. The four treatises are the divine names, the mystical theology, the celestial hierarchy, and the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Although these works pass under the name of the Athenian who was converted by the Apostle Paul as mentioned in Acts 17.34, the works are not referred to before the close of the fifth century. 
Earlier controversies over the reliability of these writings were set aside when they were confirmed by Maximus Confessor and quoted by the Lateran Council held in 649. They were translated into Syriac by Sergius of Roshenna, who died in 536. In 827, the Byzantine Emperor Michael II sent gifts to Louis the Pious, among them the works of Dionysius the Arapagite, and Hilduin, the chaplain of the king and later bishop of Paris, had them translated into Latin. In 858, Scotus Ariagina made a new translation into Latin. From this, they became known and influential in the West. These writings remain of the greatest importance even today in the Orthodox Church. The oldest surviving manuscript of the works of Dionysius the Arapagite is Sinai Syria 52, a manuscript of the 6th century, that is, the very century in which these works were first translated into Syriac and the century following their first emergence. The Hungarian scholar Is van Perso had edited the works of Dionysius included in this manuscript, working from a microfilm that was made by the Library of Congress in 1950. But there are areas of the manuscript that were damaged or stained, and these were illegible in the microfilm. He came to Sinai for the first time in July of this year and was able to study the manuscript in some detail. From his reading of the original and from the high resolution digital images that we were able to take and send him, he hopes to make a new edition of the text. We know from the enumeration on the first folio of this manuscript that it is missing the first two choirs but an additional six folios of this manuscript turned up in the new finds, and there are also folios belonging to this manuscript in Paris and Milan. Between all of these, the first two choirs are complete, forming the introduction to the translation made by Sergius of Roshenna. The Codex Sinaiticus has been called the world's oldest Bible. It was written between 325 and 350 by professional scribes using the finest parchments. It originally consisted of 740 leaves and contained the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation and in addition to early Christian writings, the Epistle of Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. Sadly, due to Constantine Tischendorf, the leaves of this manuscript are now dispersed among four institutions, the British Library, the Library of the University of Leipzig, the State Library of Russia at St. Petersburg, and St. Catherine's Monastery at Sinai. The Sinai leaves were recovered with the new finds and consists of 12 entire leaves and fragments from an additional four. Although the monastery has always regretted the loss of this manuscript, in 2005, we began a collaboration with the other three institutions, setting aside our differences to accomplish something so important, the conservation of the original leaves and their publication, both on the internet and in facsimile. Together with a complete new transcription of the entire manuscript, in this way, the leaves would be virtually reunited and made accessible to scholars and students around the world. The conservation of the leaves and fragments of Sinai was carried out in May of 2008, and the following month, scholars from England came to transcribe the text. They read from the original leaves, sometimes backlighting them to be able to make out faded or damaged letters. But there were times when high-resolution digital photographs reveal more of the text and using these images, they could consult with other scholars about complex passages, especially those passages where there had been multiple corrections. The manuscript and transcription were posted on the internet in July of last year, and the printed facsimile will be ready the first week of December, just four weeks from now. In 2006, conservators completed a survey of the Sinai manuscripts, recording the state of each volume and taking photographs of the bindings. Nicola Saris, a Greek from Patmos, has used these photographs to study the tooling on the manuscripts. From the decorative stamps used in the bindings, he has been able to reconstruct 
which manuscripts were bound in the same workshop and determine whether the bindings were executed elsewhere or made at Sinai itself. Earlier last year, he brought to my attention one of the photographs made during the survey. This was Sinai Greek 2289, and he knew from his research that it was one of a group of 18 bindings made at the monastery in the first quarter of the 18th century. On the inside back board, the paper lining had been partially torn away, revealing a parchment with Greek majuscule script. Was it too much to hope that this was yet another fragment of the Codex Sinaiticus? The more we examined it, the more convinced we became that indeed it was. The text is from the first chapter of the book of Joshua, the 11th verse, in which Joshua commands the children of Israel, prepare ye victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. In every detail, this fragment seemed to match the Codex. The monastery has other leaves of the Codex Sinaiticus from the same book, which would have been written by the same scribe. When we juxtapose letters of these leaves over the image of the newly revealed fragment, the exact correspondence seemed further confirmation of this identification. It was universal practice in earlier centuries to use parchment fragments in repairing or binding earlier texts. But now we are presented with the daunting task of wanting to reveal the whole of this fragment without the risk of damaging it in the process. Experienced conservators will need to discuss the safest way to recover this leaf. It may be that advanced scanning techniques could reveal more of the text without attempting to remove the fragment for the time being. We should not rule out the possibility of simply leaving the fragment as it is waiting for the technology to develop. This would be better than to act in haste and risk damaging or losing the text. The oldest manuscripts of Sinai are written on parchment. Even after paper reached the Arab world in the 10th century, parchment remained the preferred writing material. Parchment is made from the skins of calf or sheep, and the process is highly specialized. As a result, parchment has always been expensive and often difficult to find, but it can be used to produce a book that is beautiful and that will last for centuries. If a text written on parchment is no longer wanted, the writing can be rubbed off and the valuable parchment used a second time. The original writing remains faintly visible beneath the second text. This is what is known as a palimpsest. Because Sinai was so remote, there are many palimpsests, some 110 manuscripts contained leaves with an underlying text. Very often, it is this original text that is of the greater interest to scholars. If the original writing was large and if the second text was written at right angles, it is possible with some patience to make out the underlying text. But most often, this is not the case, and the original writing can remain elusive. In the late 19th century, it was customary to apply chemicals to the page to try to enhance the faded ink. A common reagent was hydrosulfurate of ammonia. There were times when this made it easier to read the original script, but one also risked damaging the page and ruining it. Recent advances in digital photography techniques promised to make these texts more legible. Pages are photographed using narrow wavelengths of light, ranging from infrared to ultraviolet in what is called multispectral imaging. Photographs taken at specific wavelengths are often combined, and image processing algorithms are applied to the same techniques used to enhance the faint images of stars and galaxies in outer space. Results are not always certain. Also, it is not only technology that is required to recover the text, it still requires a sharp eyes and long training of experienced scholars to decipher the resulting image. Leading scientists in the field came to Sinai in September of last year and took photographs for a pilot project. 
The results were encouraging, and they had been promised funding for a five-year project to photograph manuscripts in their entirety and to make them available to scholars. Even the pilot project revealed important discoveries. Historians have pointed to surprising parallels between earliest Egyptian monasticism and earliest Irish monasticism. This can be seen in the architecture and the organization of Irish monasticism. We also know that the Irish retained a knowledge of Greek after it had been lost elsewhere in the West. Seven monks from Egypt are said to be buried in Ireland, and the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris possesses an Irish guide for the use of pilgrims to Skeet in Egypt. At Sinai, we have only one Latin manuscript, a Psalter thought to have been written in Jerusalem in the 10th century. But among the new finds were manuscripts, leaves written in Latin and Merovingian and Visigothic hands. One of the most exciting discoveries was an Arabic manuscript that seems to date from the 9th century, making it very early for an Arabic text. The manuscript is itself made of a patchwork of smaller pieces of parchment, many of which are palimpsests. It contains both classical and biblical texts in elegant majuscule Greek. It also contains texts in Latin, and one of these hands has been identified as written in an insular script. This is a term used to classify a style of writing that began in Ireland in the seventh century and then spread to England, where it flourished between AD 600 and 850. This was the age of Aden and Cuthbert and Bede, the time of an unusual flowering of monasticism in England. Now for the first time we have manuscript evidence of direct contact between this world and Sinai. This is evidence that their horizon did not stop at Rome. And can we say, one of the reasons for this flowering would have been their direct contact with the wellsprings of monasticism in Egypt and Sinai. There is one last manuscript I would like to describe, and that is Sinai Greek II, a 10th century manuscript containing the texts of Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus, with commentary written in the margins. These notations are invaluable in showing us how the texts of the scriptures were understood. The commentary is drawn from the writings of 24 authors. These include Josephus and Philo, who lived in the first century. The commentary also includes variant readings from the translations of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek made by Aquila, Theodotion, and Symmachus as alternatives to the Septuagint. The other writings span from Melito of Sardis, who lived in the second century, to Severus of Antioch, who lived in the sixth. They include John Chrysostom, the foremost representative of the Antiochene school of interpretation, which favored the more literal and historical, to Cyril of Alexandria, who is known for his allegorical interpretations. The predominant commentator is Theodora de Cyrus, who sought to keep a middle course between a strict historical reading of the text and what he considered excessive allegorizing. At the same time, he was careful to guard the text Christological and in some cases, ecclesiological fulfillment. He is thus respectful of the accomplishments of both Antiochian and Alexandrian scholarship and his commentary serves as a synthesis of earlier insights. Let us consider three passages that comment on the first chapters of Exodus. Cyril of Alexandria invites us to see a parallel between the life of Moses and the life of Christ. This understanding is very early. We find a specific reference to Moses as a type of Jesus in the epistle of Barnabas, which dates to the end of the first century. Moses was born at a time when Pharaoh had commanded all the male children of the Hebrews to be put to death. He fled to Midian to escape the wrath of the king. He drove away the evil shepherds and gave life-sustaining waters to the flock. He wrought signs and wonders and delivered the children of Israel from bondage. He led them into the wilderness where they were nourished by food from heaven and drank water that flowed forth from the rock. 
When the children of Israel had sinned, Moses was their mediator with God. He revealed to them the law and will of God. He fashioned a serpent of bronze, and all who looked to it were healed. When he stretched out his hands in the form of a cross, the Amalekites were defeated. He brought the children of Israel to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Each of these incidents in the life of Moses finds its resonance in the life of Christ. Eusebius of Emesa writes that the ark which preserved the life of Moses upon the Nile was made in imitation of the ark that preserved Noah and his family upon the waters. The ark of Noah served as a type of the ark of Moses, and the ark is itself a symbol of the church preserving the lives of the faithful in the midst of the storms of life. In the third chapter of Exodus, we read that an angel appeared to Moses out of the midst of the burning bush. God himself spoke with Moses, saying, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Theodore de Cyrus understands the revelation of God at the burning bush as a foreshadowing of the incarnation. In the fullness of time, the light of divinity through birth shone from the Holy Virgin into human life, as St. Gregory of Nyssa has written in his Life of Moses. The burning bush also becomes a prefiguring of the Virgin Mary. In all of these insights, we trace a common pattern. An event, person, or place of the past becomes an archetype that we invoke to reveal the significance of a later event, person, or place. The earlier is said to be a type of the later, from the Greek word typos, meaning prototype, pattern, or figure. When two events are thus correlated, it is said that a typology is established between them. The later event will never be precisely identical with the earlier to which the appeal is made, but the correlation is sought as a way of adapting or interpreting the present experience by means of the older event, person or place, and thus celebrating the new event and revealing the providential continuity in the historical experience. These same parallels are inherent in the scriptures themselves. After the destruction of the flood, Noah was commanded by God, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. These words are the same which God commanded Adam, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Noah is thus seen as a new Adam preserving over a renewed creation. A typology is established between the two texts. Typologies do not always link earlier events with later experience. The prophets of Israel also invoke these same correlations in speaking of future hopes. The prophet Hosea recalled the sojourn in the wilderness with longing. It had been a time when God was close to his people. Again, God would bring Israel into the wilderness where the covenantal alliance would be reconsecrated as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. The prophet Micah writes that God will again show marvelous things according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt. These typologies reach a certain culmination in the prophecies of Isaiah. The return from the captivity of Babylon to Zion is seen as a new exodus and the first is invoked for the mighty acts of God that took place at that time. In eschatological vision, the prophet Isaiah also sees the conversion of the nations who will be a part of this new exodus to Zion and there the establishment of a universal messianic kingdom. In the New Testament, we find a common, constant appeal to the Old Testament as a way of grasping the significance of contemporary events. Christ himself said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, one of the earliest epistles to St. Paul, this typology is already highly developed. The children of Israel passed through the sea 
And in the wilderness they ate manna and drank water that sprang forth from the rock. These are types of Christian baptism and of spiritual food and drink. The defining moment for the children of Israel is here being invoked as a paradigm of the Christian life. Here we have one of the most important keys to understand not only the scriptures, but many of the complex orthodox hymns that dwell upon these same parallels. This insight is also crucial to understanding one of my favorite icons, an 11th century Sinai icon of the enthroned virgin and Christ child, surrounded by prophets and saints, an icon of exceptional beauty and significance. In the center of the icon, the Holy Virgin is seated upon an imperial throne, holding Christ in her arms. The child grasps her veil and kicks exuberantly in stark contrast to the pensive and introspective gaze of the Virgin. Below the throne, we read the inscription, Joachim and Anna conceived, and Adam and Eve were freed. This is a reference to the Kentuckian composed by Romanos the Melod for the Feast of the Nativity of the Theotokos, which begins, Joachim and Anna were freed from the reproach of childlessness, and Adam and Eve from the corruption of death, O Immaculate One, by thy holy nativity. Beneath the throne is a depiction of Joseph the betrothed. Adam and Eve stand to his left, and Joachim and Anna to his right, each with hands raised in entreaty to the Holy Virgin and Child. Adam and Eve, through whom sorrow and death entered into the world, are here contrasted with Joachim and Anna, who gave birth to the Mother of Life. The central composition is framed on both sides by depictions of 15 prophets. Each of whole holds a scroll in his left hand while raising his right hand in blessing. In many of the depictions, an emblem has also been added, the symbol of the prophecy that is written on the scroll. These texts foretell the Virgin Mary and the Incarnation. The prophet Moses stands before the bush that burned without being consumed, the interpretation of which we have seen in the annotations from the Sinai manuscript. He holds a scroll with the words, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. For Aaron, the Holy Virgin, was foretold by the rod that miraculously budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. Jacob is depicted with a ladder extending from earth to heaven, with angels ascending and descending on it, at which he exclaimed, This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. David is portrayed with the ark and the verse, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou in the ark of thy holiness. Ezekiel stands before the closed gate. Then the Lord said unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. The prophet Isaiah receives the live coal that one of the seraphim took with tongs from the altar before the Lord. Daniel points to the stone cut out without hands. Abakum, Habakkuk, is depicted before a mountain holding a scroll with the prophecy, God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, while Valam looks up to the star. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Solomon's scroll refers to the house of wisdom having seven pillars. Gideon witnesses to the dew that formed imperceptibly upon the fleece while the ground around it remained dry. The central panels to either side of the Holy Virgin depict Simeon and Anna and Zechariah and Elizabeth. The scroll of Zechariah has the words that he spoke, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. While Elizabeth says, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Simeon bears a scroll that reads, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. While the prophetess Anna says, This child hath established heaven and earth. 
In the center of the top register of the icon, Christ is depicted in glory, the heavens for his throne and the earth for his footstool, each subtly indicated with polished gold. An inscription above proclaims him the king of glory. He is flanked by six-winged seraphim and many-eyed cherubim. His throne is in the midst of the four living creatures beheld by the prophet Ezekiel. Each living creature holds a book. They were identified very early in the church as symbols of the four evangelists. To Christ's left, John the Baptist bears a scroll with the words, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me because he was before me. The Apostle Peter holds his confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To Christ's right, John the theologian is portrayed with the verse, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. While the Apostle Paul says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. This icon links prophecies in the Old Testament with their fulfillment in the New. The sorrow of Adam and Eve is transformed into joy by the birth of the Virgin. But Mary's gaze is directed towards the dark words of Simeon, which anticipate the Passion, and the child moves exuberantly in his mother's arms, eager to accomplish that for which he has come into the world. He is seated above as a triumphant king of glory. The icon is thus also a revelation of the new creation, the heavenly kingdom. The attention of the viewer moves from joy to sorrow to triumph, and from past to present to future, but a future that has already been inaugurated. The heritage of perceiving the Old Testament type and its fulfillment in the new has bequeathed a rich inheritance to the church. What service does not dwell upon God's deliverance of his people and his triumph over their foes? They went on from Egypt with an high hand. They passed through the midst of the sea, and in the wilderness they built the tabernacle of the Most High according to the pattern which was shewed to Moses in the mount, and it was filled with his glory. It is given to the monks of Sinai daily to be reminded of these mighty acts of God by the very place where they dwell. St. Catherine's monastery is a treasury filled with things new and old. Scholars still have much to learn from the library, its numerous icons, vestments, ecclesiastical vessels, its architecture. In all of this, it is a veritable ark in the wilderness. But the manuscripts, icons, and churches were created for the living community. And this is perhaps the most important survival of all, that within these ancient walls, there should still be preserved the cycle of services and times of prayer, the spiritual goals that have remained the same from the earliest times to our own day. Sinai remains, as it ever was, the very emblem of the encounter between God and man. Thank you. What books would you recommend for someone who wants to become more familiar with Greek Orthodoxy? The classic text is one written by a layman named Timothy Ware, first published in 1963. It's called The Orthodox Church. He later became an Orthodox monk with the name Callistus, and now for many years he has been both a bishop in the Orthodox Church and a professor at Oxford University, and he retired just recently, but he still lives at Oxford and still has a ministry there. The book is so brief and at the same time masterful that it has been translated into Greek and is used in the Greek Orthodox Church, but it is, um, I think it's never been surpassed. Other people like other books better, but that is my favorite. Okay, next. Um, what year was this icon uh, set uh, on the book? There is um, discussion about icons. They, they are not dated, they're not signed. It's by making very, very careful comparisons with others that where you, where you know something about them that you can say, we attribute this to this century, that century. So it's still under discussion, but it's thought to date from the late 12th century. 
from the 9th to the 12th, 12th, 12th late 12th century late so the late 1100s the polished halos that you see in the polished gold that is a trademark of the Sinai icons does St. Catherine's tell a different story about the discovery of Codex Sinaiticus than the one usually told uh, about Tischendorf? We have just finished a collaboration with the other three institutions that hold these and fragments of the Codex Sinaiticus. And the Archbishop could have said, the history of the text is so controversial, let's stay completely away from it and only concentrate on the text as a scholarly work. But instead, he took the opposite approach. He said, we all have to face up to the recent history of this text. So if we are going to be a part of this collaboration, it must include a complete investigation into the recent history. And by recent history, he meant 1844, when Tischendorf first visited Sinai, took 43 leaves with him, which he gave to the University of Leipzig, up to 1933, when the leaves that had been in Russia were sold to England. Everyone knows the story that Konstantin Tishinov rescued this when it was on the verge of being burned, but I think that increasingly scholars are discounting the story. It was not something that Tischendorf wrote in the letters that he wrote to his wife at the time. It was something that he wrote many, many years later trying to justify his taking of the leaves. It is clear that parchment is leather and it doesn't burn, and Tischendorf never said that himself. He quoted someone else as saying it. So he was like sliding around uh, and uh, evading and trying to find a justification for taking these leaves. The collaboration has now revealed many, many documents that were sealed in archives that were off limits to scholars until this collaboration. We know now that Tischendorf had relatively little, little to do with the final outcome. The manuscript was published in 1862. It was the oldest known Bible at the time. It was sensational. So there were some within Russia who said, now we're obligated to give it back. It doesn't belong to us. But there were others in Russia who said, this is our opportunity to have the world's oldest Bible. Let's see what we can do to get it. And it was at a difficult time for the monastery. We know now that there were letters written by the Russian ambassadors saying, we will not recognize a new archbishop, we will not give you back the money that we have impounded here in Russia until you sign over the codex. So all of these documents have now been made accessible and will be published next year by the British Library. Uh, the more you read about the history, the more complicated it all becomes. And scholars have said this is the case that lawyers love because by the time it's settled, <laughs> uh, many, many cases will have been heard. Uh, it becomes bewilderingly complicated. I think you can say that the legal aspects are still extremely complicated, but the monastery has a moral case that it was taken under duress. There are a lot of people who are very interested in Greek Orthodoxy in a couple of different perspectives. So at the risk of being intrusive but knowing your gentle heart, does your beard and head covering signify anything? In the West, the tonsure was what you see in the photographs of Francis of Assisi where they would shave their head and leave a little halo of hair around it. We know in the Old Testament that Samson was told not to cut his hair or his beard because he was consecrated to God. And that is why he did not cut his hair or his beard. And that is a tradition that is kept in the Orthodox Church, that uh, monastics are consecrated to God, and so their hair is cut in the ceremony of tonsure, and then it's not cut afterwards. And uh, the length of a beard has nothing to do with how long you've had a beard. Some people have had a beard for many years, and it's relatively short. Others, it's more long. <laughs> Okay, could you um, briefly tell us a little bit about your journey from growing up uh, uh, in an um, uh, evangelical household and, and moving into Greek Orthodoxy? Well, just very briefly, because I would rather concentrate on the, uh, the manuscripts of Sinai. I, I, I grew up knowing a great deal about the New Testament and a great deal about the Reformation, more recent history of the church, but not anything that happened in between. And it was curiosity that led me to read first medieval history and later Byzantine history. And after I had read many texts on Byzantine history, I began to be concentrated more on the history of the church. 
and only after I had read many, church, many books on the church history that I began to attend Orthodox services. And I remember how bewildering, confusing the services were because I had no understanding of the structure of the services. But then I was determined to connect what I had what I was seeing with what I had already read, and the more I understood, the more I felt that I'd come to a great treasure. So I became Orthodox as a student in university, and then it was a much smaller step to enter a monastery where the church becomes your whole life. Okay, um, a couple of questions, if we could, about St. Catherine's Monastery. Uh, I think people have an interest in the burning bush. Um, uh, 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 could, one question was, could you expand on how the burning bush and Mary were seen uh, uh, to be related in a sense, or the burning bush a type for Mary? Uh, St. Macadius, who lived in the 5th century, has written a very, very beautiful homily on the burning bush. He said that the, the, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed by the fire. This was the same fire that wafted the prophet Elijah to heaven in the chariot of fire. It was the same fire that ascended upon the holy apostles as flames of fire in the day of Pentecost. And it was of this fire that Christ spoke when he says, I have come to send fire upon the earth and what would I if it be already kindled? The fact that the bush, the, the, the fact that God spoke to Moses through the bush is seen as an anticipation of the incarnation when God becomes, takes upon himself our human nature. The fact that the bush burned without being consumed by the flames and that through the burning bush God spoke to Moses has been seen as a, as a parallel of the incarnation and the place of the Virgin Mary in the incarnation. There are many, many hymns in the Orthodox Church that draw this parallel. It is not something you find in the West until the time of the Crusades, and that was when the Christians in the West came in contact with this, and then you do see it in the West. In the Chartres Cathedral in France, there's a carving of the Virgin Mary standing on the burning bush and in the Canterbury Tales the prioress mentions the burning bush as the type of the Virgin Mary so these are parallels that enter into the West at the time of the Crusades. Scholastically we were taught that Codex Sinaiticus is um, not just the oldest surviving full Bible um, but that it's the actual Greek text by and large that's used as the, the baseline for the Greek version, or for, for the Greeks' New Testaments that we buy today, that, that scholars use to translate out of. Um, from your perspective, as, as uh, someone who's a librarian at this monastery which uh, kept this treasure, do you have any insight into how reliable it is as a text? One question, uh, as to how old it is and how it came to be at the monastery and whether or not it might have been one of the 50 copies of scripture that were requisitioned by uh, Constantine. Okay, the, the easy answer is that we know it was written between 325 and 350, and scholars tend to date things late in, um, out, of, out, of, out of a sense of safety. <laughs> so uh, we, can, we can be more ambitious and say, let's say 325. But that means that it was written just after the end of the persecution of the Christians. It was the Emperor Constantine who put an end to the persecution of the Christians. The first scriptures were written in hiding by people who were not professional scribes. They were written sometimes at peril of death. One of the first things the Romans would do was to confiscate copies of the scriptures and to destroy them. And the earliest surviving copies of the scriptures are written on papyrus which was the common writing material of the day, but it's not something that survives in a Mediterranean climate. That's why the earliest copies of the scriptures are written on papyrus, and they survive in the sands of Egypt, and they were recovered by archeologists mostly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Codex Sinaiticus is the world's oldest Bible written on parchment. It is the world's oldest complete New Testament, and scholars feel that it preserves a very pure strand of the text, and so they will always want to know what does the Codex Sinaiticus say when they're studying the history of the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament translated into Greek, and the New Testament, which was of course composed in Greek. So it's extremely important for scholars, and it's a wonderful thing that the 
text has now been access made accessible online with detailed photographs and a completely new transcription, which is the most expensive part of this co recent collaboration. And in just a few weeks, the facsimile will be available. It's being printed in China, and the first copy was bound by hand and sent by Federal Express to London just last week when we had a, a meeting there, and we were able to see it and make a present formal presentation of the first hand-bound copy of the facsimile. So it will be a, a very important opportunity for people to be able to read it for themselves. Many, many times they will see readings of the Codex Sinaiticus, what it says. Here they have an opportunity to open a, a beautifully printed facsimile and read these passages for themselves. We know that the Emperor Constantine ordered 50 copies of the scriptures from Eusebius, who was a bishop of Caesarea. We know that he had an important library in Caesarea, many manuscripts brought from Alexandria, where there was a whole tradition of copying manuscripts carefully. If you saw something that was wrong, you didn't correct it, you copied it out exactly as it was written. And that's why the Eusebius was asked to make these copies of the scriptures. It's always, we don't know exactly if any of these copies survive. We don't even know, were they New Testaments, Old Testaments, lectionaries? What does he mean by 50 copies of the scriptures? Could it have been several types? But we know that the Codex Sinaiticus would have been an expensive volume to produce, and it could well be one of those 50 copies. So it remains um, an, um, a tantalizing thought. We can't say more than that. As to the re reliability of the text, scholars feel that it is an early text that preserves a very pure stream of the text and it must be taken care of, uh, into account by anyone studying the history of the text. But I, I would like to say that when you read works of textual criticism, they are dwelling on the passages that differ and on the passages where there might be reasons for those differences and you lose sight of the fact that for the greater part of the scriptures there are no differences. And it is important to remember that the readings do not change the theology. The theology comes through in any manuscript, and the Orthodox have always said the gospel is behind the gospels. It is the message and the meaning and the significance. So that is what comes through in all of the manuscripts, and that is what is the greatest significance. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much.